pick up from where I left off yesterday. People asked me for some references to the force strip problem. In fact, I was surprised how many people seem to be interested in this. Uh, um, here's a reference. This is an interesting uh, early reference, um, and it's in a book. And uh, so it might be difficult for you to find. You can get it on Paola's homepage here, or you can search for Rhine's dynamics of unsteady currents on Google, and this will be one of the top three hits, which will provide it as a PDF. Another interesting reference. Uh, is this paper by McEwen, Thompson and Plum from 1980, which has been cited less than 20 times since 1980, but which is a very thorough both lab and experimental uh, study of the problem where they force the strip in this case by pumping water into and out of holes in the bottom of a rapidly rotating tank. It was one of the first experiments in this configuration and they used a second forcing mechanism by putting a rubber bottom on their tank with little wheels like moving mountains which would go around and stir things up. So those are the two um, interesting references. I'm not sure they're the first. In fact, I'm pretty sure the meteorologists must have their favorite references for this problem because it's, as I said, um, a basic conceptual model of where the jet stream comes from. So uh, I finished last lecture by remarking on the fact that uh, if we're talking about the force beta plane problem with homogeneous forcing, then there's at least one uh, non-dimensional parameter uh, which has gone unrecognized, I think, for a surprisingly long time. I th there may be an earlier reference from this, but there, I don't think there's anything in the 20th century, although Vallis and Maltrude uh, studied the problem much before that. And that's what I'm calling the zonostrophy number, which is made of the energy injection rate, the beta effect, and the bottom drag. So that's a non-dimensional number, capital Z. And then I mentioned there's three length scales, and they can all be rel the ratios of those length scales uh, can be related to funny fractional powers of the um, zonostrophy number. So these are not independent length scales. Um, they're related, in fact, by this formula, uh, which is equivalent to that expression for the zonostrophy number. So the hypothesis, which I don't think is true, uh, is that the zo uh, but which is quite popular, is that the zonostrophy number uh, is the only relevant non-dimensional parameter. Okay. So, for instance, if you believe that, uh, then you would be saying that there's another, at least another non-dimensional parameter we could make, because we specify the length scale of the forcing in this problem. So there's L sub F, the length scale of the forcing. So clearly I can divide L sub F by any one of those other three length scales. Let me pick the Lily length scale. That's another non-dimensional parameter uh, which is thought to be irrelevant provided that uh, L sub F, the small scale forcing, L sub, L sub F uh, is much less than all these other length scales I'm mentioning, which in turn are much less than the domain scale. So this is the conceptual model that people have in mind. Uh, you've got small scale forcing, you've got a big domain, and interesting things are happening at intermediate scales. And of course, uh, what you would do if you were doing this systematically, which is not what I'm going to do, you would start at small values of the zonostrophy number and you would try and figure out the critical value of the zonostrophy number at which the zonal jets first occurred as an instability, okay? By analyzing the linear stability of a turbulent flow or stochastic flow, because it is stochastically forced. Now, um, instead, uh, I just wanted to finish quickly by mentioning uh, some speculative ideas, interesting speculative ideas, uh, motivated actually by gas giant planets about what happens in the other limit, not small zonostrophy number, but very big zonostrophy number. In fact, huge um, zonostrophy number. It's probably irrelevant. Well, it's almost certainly, I think, irrelevant to the ocean and the atmosphere, but I'd like to briefly um, mention it. Because it's a very natural idea, actually, when you start thinking about this. It goes back to a paper by Phil Marcus in 1993. Uh, it's the idea that you would mix potential vorticity 
into what's called a staircase. So I'm showing here the staircase. Here's the beta Y ramp, and you've got pretty strong eddies. You're in the limit of, as I'll say later, zonostrophy numbers bigger than 10 to the 20. So it's very strongly forced or very weakly damped. And as a result of that, uh, the eddies mix the PV, but they can't mix it all the way uh, for reasons which I'll come to. And so the best they can do is create a staircase, which I've shown here as a regular structure. That is, each, of the staircase, each, of each step of the staircase has the same length. And now, um, recognizing that, let's focus on this strip here. And there's an initially unknown parameter here, L, which is the width of the strip. So the strip goes from, in dimensional terms, from minus L to L. And inside that region, I'm simply going to solve the equation uh, du dy equals beta y. So that gives me a parabolic velocity profile uh, with uniform PV in that strip. And I construct the parabola so that there's um, no net momentum in the solution because the forcing is not putting in any momentum. So that's my solution in the first strip. And then it's just periodically extended in a regular fashion to other strips. So at this point, L is simply a parameter. This is true uh, for all Ls. And the final step would be to determine the step thickness uh, L, or the step width L. You do that from the energy balance uh, by arguing that most of the energy, or a, a substantial fraction of the, of the energy, is in the zonal mean flow. And this limit, the eddies, are actually energetically weaker than the zonal mean flow. So uh, loosely speaking, you can then equate the, m the mean square velocity to epsilon over mu, and that gives you a formula down here in the corner of the transparency uh, for the step width. And this is simply enforcing Rhine scaling, if you like. This is the Rhine's length for the step, OK? Um, so this is a figure. Um, which is adapted from um, Scott and Ritchell's paper in uh, Vallis's textbook. So these, these were the uh, Scott and Ritchell were the first people to try and achieve this um, staircase regime numerically. So in there, and by the way, these are not standard um, pseudo-spectral um, calculations with, um, with white noise forcing. This is a very, uh, well, I won't even get into the details of their forcing or their numerics, which I describe as heroic numerics to get into this regime. So in the first illustration here, um, the zonostrophy number is only 3 to the 20, which is 3.5 times 10 to the 9. Why the power 20? It's because uh, these authors, instead of dealing with the zonostrophy number, uh, prefer to think of it as the ratio of the Rhine's length to the vallis maltrude length, uh, which is, you know, the zonostrophy number is that ratio of length scales to the power 20, okay? Uh, which gives you my preferred notation, 3.5 by 10 to the 9. This is pretty similar to what we see in pseudo-spectral calculations. You get a, ni a fairly regular um, a fairly regular set of jets, not as regular as some of the uh, solutions I saw, and something which is pretty far from the staircase regime in the sense that Q bar does not look like a staircase. It's beta Y plus sort of smallish perturbations. Okay? Then they crank it up <laughs> uh, 11 times 10 to the 20. Um, and this is what they get. So they certainly see discontinuities in the, um, in the PV. But it's not a regular staircase. So as I'm joking here, uh, this staircase would not be accepted by any reasonable building inspector. Uh, it's just too irregular. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the best attempt so far uh, to achieve this regime that was first uh, described by Marcus, in which you're mixing the PV into a staircase. Uh, what is very different in this kind of simulation with respect to the one that are done using hyperviscosity or or viscosity is the fact that uh, there are waves that are propagating, I mean edge waves, that are propagating along the, yeah. the, 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 st the stairs, actually, uh, along the along PV the edge. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 
there's many details. And so it's, it's I think it's it, it will be critical in the future to understand whether they're right to get these or the more classical simulation are yeah. correct not to, to get these because I this makes a, b a big difference. I think they're doing one thing right, which is very different from the um, forcing protocol I described where there's statistically homogeneous white noise forcing which is acting everywhere all the time. So when they describe their forcing procedure in this model, uh, what they're doing is they're forcing in physical space, they're injecting, I think, um, I may not get this right, but the main point is they're forcing the system by reaching in and putting in little vortex dipoles which are physically confined in physical space. So you reach in and you force by <laughs> injecting a little vortex dipole at that point in space. And as a result, you're not violating, the forcing is not violating potential vorticity uh, conservation anywhere else except at that small region of space where you suddenly inject the dipole. Okay, So if you're doing what I originally described with the homogeneous forcing, the forcing is um, destroying or opposing material conservation of PV everywhere and every when. Whereas the Scott and Dritchell forcing is, is very broadband in spectral space, but localized in physical space. So that may, I think, if you were looking for a really qualitative difference between this calculation and the ones I was describing before, it's the, it's the fact that the forcing uh, is physically is confined in physical space and is not destroying PV conservation. Yeah. Considering that we defi also defined Ryan's scale and little scale in the initial value problem, do you think we uh, initial value simulation we can retrieve that as well? Potentially, it would be a very clean result. Yes, because you wouldn't be arguing over. Yeah, you wouldn't have to get into the gory details of how you're forcing it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought that in the staircases of uh, Marcus, there were another length scale, the Rosby radius, that screened the interaction between fluid particle and then can change a bit. Uh, I think the, the uh, no, I think the original paper by Marcus. There's a second paper by Marcus, actually, Marcus and Lee, which I probably should have put up here, um, which has a clean picture like this. I don't think they got into the Rossby deformation. There was a subsequent paper by McIntyre and Ritchell that extended the staircase to include the, um, um, the deformation length. I, I'd also like to mention, actually, there's an older reference than this, to the at least where you have one PV step or three PV steps, which is Paolo Chessy's thesis where this was proposed as a mechanism uh, for the Gulf Stream front, that was one big step, and then a recirculate, an inertial recirculation on either side of the Gulf Stream, and that must have been, I don't know, the late 80s, I think. So that's the end of uh, what I wanted to say about force beta plane turbulence. It's very easy to produce zonal jets, any sort of forcing will do it. Uh, we d I don't think we have a good understanding on how uh, the jets and eddies depend on this non-dimensional parameter, or even if that's the only non-dimensional parameter that's important. I don't think so because I believe in the small z regime, uh, the length scale of the forcing is not irrelevant at all, which is what I'm saying here. Uh, and then rather than continue with this, if I was going to give another lecture, I'd talk about a more difficult problem, but I'm not, so that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which? Uh, you mean like the movie? Yeah. Uh, well, I can give you a copy of the movie. Um, and there's a paper by Srinivasan and Young which has some, some of the results in it, particularly a linear stability, and this is following earlier work by Farrell and Ianu, uh, particularly a linear stability analysis showing that in the small z regime, uh, you have to worry about the length scale of the forcing. I'll just play the movie again while I take questions so people can look at it. 
So you conclude that the for the length of the forcing is probably relevant. Did did you show that in your slide? No, I did not. I did not discuss that. Oh. Uh, that would that would be another lecture. Uh, okay. It would yeah. I'm a learner. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a question to Freddie via you, actually. So Freddie made the comment that the um, the waves that you see on the PV interfaces um, in the Scott and Ritual calculation are perhaps unusual. But I guess I just wanted to probe that a bit more because, I mean, if one looks at a synoptic snapshot of these kind of jet flows, I thought that you do see waves on jets. So, do, I mean... Do, you, do either of you have a comment on that? I have a, an embarrassing confession. I don't remember whether the Scott and Ritchell included the deformation length or whether they did a... Um, is this a one-and-a-half-layer calculation? Do, do you know, Peter? This is barotropic. Okay, that's good. barotropic, yeah. yeah. Barotropic, that's good. Uh, well, actually, I would say, yes, the, the waves are very prominent here. Um, they're less prominent in the simulation I just showed, but they are there, and they're much larger scale, though. Um, you so probably you can't see them. They're, they're what I call, what's called in the literature actually, satellite modes uh, or zonons. So you can see them if you do a Fourier analysis in particular. This is a point made by Galper and, and his collaborators that there are these jets, but there's um, actually a Kx equal one um, meander on the jets, or maybe k Kx equals one or two very low zonal wave numbers which represent jet meandering in this direction. And I've looked at this and I can't see them. Although if you but do... You but you would... I mean, it, it would be difficult to see them in the PV field, wouldn't it, right? Yeah. I mean, if you... If you plot U, for example, then you can see them more clearly, I think. <laughs> well... An XY picture of U. Yeah. Is that... That's, yeah. Hmm. It's difficult to see them there, but you certainly don't have any trouble seeing them in the Scott and Ritchell uh, PV field. Well, you don't, but that's because it's a sort of um, quasi <laughs> piecewise constant PV field by design, isn't it? Yes, like that's right. They're very, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're um, apparent at the discontinuities. I, I guess actually, before I relinquish the microphone, um, <laughs> the other <laughs> the other question is about when you're showing these averages of Q. I mean, one one point, of course, is that if these were straightforward zonal averages then if you had wavy PV interfaces, you would smooth out discontinuities, right? So just to clarify, all these Q bars that you show on the right-hand side, are they zonal averages or are they some kind of um, you know, PV coordinate-based averages? I believe they're just zonal averages. Right, so, so then I think you know, that when you say in the top picture that you don't seem to form a very good staircase, I mean, it could be you formed a staircase that simply has wavy boundaries. And when you're taking the zonal average, you're, y you know, you're averaging <laughs> the wavy boundary. Yeah, so to some extent, but I, you know, I, I so P, I mean, something like a PV histogram is quite a good way of sh uh, showing more clearly whether or not you have staircases. Yeah, or maybe a yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and s there's been surprisingly little attempt to use a PV histogram. Uh, even with the pseudo-spectral calculations, I guess. So Peter's saying that if you simply binned and did a frequency um, histogram of the values of Q in this field, uh, you might see um, a, a multi-mode distribution with each mode corresponding uh, to a different step, which is blurred when we just compute zonal averages through the field. May, may I answer to... to um so w what people have been seeing is that uh, looking at, for instance, uh, sp spatio uh, s spatial frequency uh, diagram is that uh, when, you when you increase the Z, I mean, you then you initially you get Rossby waves and then you have jet Rossby waves uh, that have been called zonon sometimes. And the more Z increase, the less wave you have. And so it seems to be at least consistent with uh, 
the numerical experiment that you, you may expect to have no, no wave anymore in the limit when z is very large. And so this, i this, is, uh, this contradicts this, uh, this hypothesis that there would be no wave in the very large z limit. So that's why I was uh, asking about this question. So I, I guess we have no clue about that, but uh, uh, it's really a question to know whether there are waves in the in in in, in this uh, large uh, z limit. So an another point is that uh, uh, so on Jupiter, for instance, we don't really see this. Um, uh, how did you say uh, irregular staircases on Jupiter? This seems to be quite regular. Yes, yes, I and think that's true. Yeah. Once again, I, I would emphasize that we're also ignoring the details of the forcing, which I think may be a real mistake in comparing the different models. I think that when you put forcing on the large scale, you end up in unstructured uh, jets like this, compared to small scale. But I'm not sure about this, but it's just an observation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think we should thank uh, Bill. And <laughs>